Trans humans. I'm your host, the multi sided mutant Funky M. And for those of you who just came in, this is the Mutant Thon. You see, most of humanity isn't too fond of us, or our powers, even in the 21st century. Hollywood, on the other hand, is infatuated with the tales of the X Men, an underground team of specially trained adventurers who advance the cause of unity and peace between mutants and normal humans. This is my series on Hollywood's X-Men movies and all their spectacle and entertainment. So for those of you who were wondering where I've been the past few months and why this episode is so late, don't ask. It's a long story. But I'm here now, and just in time for an apocalypse. Released in 2016, Apocalypse picks up the story of Magneto, Mystique and Professor X in the 1980s. Eric has finally found peace, which predictably means that it won't last, while Mystique is travelling the world freeing mutants from dangerous situations. But a shadow of the past threatens their future. Apocalypse features an all new yet strangely familiar class of teen mutants and the obligatory Claude cameo. So come with me, my human friends, as we revisit the notoriously turbulent 80s, where the X-Men try to prevent... Apocalypse. In ancient Egypt, the morning light is king. That's his name, by the by. En Sabanur, the morning light. Translated from the ancient Egyptian. Thanks to Gplex Translator for that one. Who knew that they could do ancient Egyptian? And it's about time for a sword-proof upgrade. But some of his guards have other plans. Rocks fall, everyone else dies, but the morning light shines on. Cut to 1983, and young Scott Summers isn't feeling too well. So Scott's brother, alias our old friend Havoc, takes little bro to see Professor X. While in East Berlin, the magnificent Mystique looks to break up an underground mutant deathmatch. And in Poland, we meet a familiar looking metal worker. And his family. In modern Egypt, we catch up with Agent McTaggart who may have just discovered something better off buried. So that golden thing that Moira found, that was actually the top of En Sabah Nur's pyramid. Its power helped him transfer into new bodies when he needed an upgrade. We know that it has power, but we don't know how much. And his awakening is felt across the globe which leads to a situation in Poland that only the Master of Magnetism can resolve. But this is rural Poland, in 1983, so Eric and wife prepare to flee. But it's too late. Well, I'll spare you the gory details, but it don't end well. And in Westchester, telekinetic telepath Jean Grey is having some jumbo nightmare. which leads Professor X to the desk of Moira McTaggart. And while the ruler of ancient Egypt isn't impressed with modern Egypt, he is impressed with a young mutant pickpocket. Apocalypse learns English from the TV. Proves that TV is useful for something. And so Apocalypse begins assembling his horsemen. Psylocke. I want to set you free. Angel. And last, but by no means least, Magneto. 
back in Westchester, Raven has returned. Just because there's not a war doesn't mean there's peace. Now I ain't one of these pro-Magneto factions with their Magneto was right t-shirts and their craziness associated with it and all that. But Mystique is right here. You know, the absence of tension is not the presence of justice. They are different things. And hiding our powers, hiding ourselves, I ain't down with that. I could go on, but you know, I'll spare you the rant and that. Let let's just get back to the story. She's worried about Magus. But using Cerebro to find Magneto causes Apocalypse to find Xavier. And Apocalypse decides on no more nukes. Before popping in to kidnap Professor X. Enter Pietro Maximoff. But he didn't save everyone. Humans and mutants alike, a moment for Alex Summers. Here come the military, and they ain't friendly. Well, I mean, flat scans are kind of clueless, but they tend to notice when all of their nukes have been launched at once, and they've got to wonder who did it. And Scott, Jean, and one Kurt Wagner take a trip to Alkali Lake to rescue their teachers, and of course, a certain very angry Clawslinger. Charles awakes in Cairo, where Apocalypse seeks to remake the world. And so the stage is set for our finale, as the second genesis of the X-Men head for Cairo, where Apocalypse's final goal is revealed. Cue a knockdown, drag out, slobber knocker battle. Yeah, I'm skipping most of the fights here. You know, Hollywood does love its mutant action. And you can find plenty of the real stuff on YouTube, you sick, sick people, if that's your bag, you know. But, yeah, it, it don't go well for most of the team here. Kurt, on the other hand, is having more success, and saves Professor X in the nick of time. But the fight isn't over yet. And the fight continues for Professor X who ventures into Apocalypse's mind and gets soundly thrashed. So it's lucky that Jean Grey has hidden depths. And so our movie ends with the very first mansion rebuild and Mystique's X-Men training class. Well, Another one down. And after a bit of thought, I decided that this one deserves its spot on the Mutant Fawn team. Weighing in at 143 minutes including credits, and post-credit coda, this is the most formulaic of the series to date, or at least since the reboot. But for the passing of time, and the seven movies that preceded this, I'd have thought that this one was suicidally overblown, even after this. We shouldn't forget that Jean Grey just took down an almost invincible mutant. That's a narrative point any future movie in the series will have to deal with. The performances, especially from Fastbender's Eric Lenscher, are genuinely affecting. Once again, you feel every blow that fate throws against a poor Jewish mutant, whose hard luck life almost led him to destroy the President of the USA, to be the bad guy everyone thought that he was. McAvoy's Charles Xavier is a little more comedic this time around, tripping over his tongue to conceal the wiping of Moira McTaggart's memory, but a great portion of the third act seems to be taken up with him screaming. And of course, Lawrence turns in an aloof performance as Mystique, whose tale this is supposed to be, according to the director. But I'll get back to that. 
As to the rest of the cast, the young leads acquit themselves well. Ty Sheridan and Sophie Turner giving a lot more personality to these characters, being Sheridan, Scott Summers and Turner's Jean Grey, than their adult counterparts ever seem to. And while Cody Smith McPhee's Nightcrawler gets a few lines and a couple of spot moments, I don't know that it makes up a complete performance. But for what it is, it's very entertaining. The flow of this movie is disjointed as we flip from tale to tale, though as the main plot congeals, all of our players coalesce in one place, and the movie starts to really come together. Although, even through all this, it's never confusing, just mildly distracting. It's formulaic, new bad guy, gather the team, big set piece third act showdown, but it's entertaining at least. And while there are a lot of characters, and there isn't enough screen time for all of them, there are no characters that we'd like to see less of. So whose movie is it? If First Class was Magneto's tale, and Days of Future Past was largely about Xavier, is this one Mystique's story? Hardly. In all of this, her part of the tale is squeezed. I don't really think that it's anyone's singular tale, which is actually to its credit. It's equal parts another heartbreak turn for Magneto, another evolution for Professor X, and Mystique finally coming to realise her place in the world is to stop the war by arming the next generation of mutant kids for a world that still hates and fears them, even if they're ever more polite about it. In summary, it's a big noisy picture that kind of washes over you, but is still a good enough movie in its own right for any popcorn night. But it doesn't really further the argument that much. So that almost brings us up to date. But in the past year or so, there have been more movies made about certain other mutants. So, this is your humble host, the multi-sided mutant Funky M, inviting you to join me again sometime soon, as next time we'll be taking a look at a mercenary with a mouth who was mutated by hand. Till then, see you around, humans!